Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery. This one I guess isn't a mystery, it's classed as a solved case but there's never really much of a mystery to solve here in the first place. I just want to share this story with you, a story that I don't think is as talked about as it should be. I do make a point on my channel not to cover mass shootings, school shootings, terrorism and things like that and I have many reasons for that which I'm not going to get into here but I'm making an exception today. This will likely be the only mass shooting I ever talk about because I think particularly in today's political climate, it's important that we know this story. We seem dangerously close to something like this story happening again today. Hatred breeds hatred, which is even more relevant with the rise of social media today. And it's dangerous when the wrong people are consuming this hate online. That's right, this is another social justice-esque video. Today we're going to be focusing on sexism and one man's complete hatred of feminists, of women, so much that he murdered 14 of them and then himself. Why? Mark Lepin was born as Camille Rodrigue Lias Garby on October 26th, 1964 in Montreal, Canada to Monique Lepin, a Canadian-born nurse, and Rashid Lias Garby, an Algerian immigrant and investment fund salesman. Rashid wasn't present at the time of his son's birth, he was actually in the Caribbean holding an illicit affair which kind of sums up the type of father he was. It was a pretty unstable childhood, the family lived in Costa Rica and Puerto Rico due to Rashid's job before returning to Montreal in 1968. According to family members, Rashid was an authoritarian who believed that women existed to serve men. He was also a violent man, both physically and verbally, and would regularly beat Monique if she ever made any kind of mistake, or even if she didn't. But his violence wasn't just reserved for his wife, his children didn't escape the anger either, particularly Gamil, who Rashid seemed to have a real issue with. He would hit his toddler son for little reason, Monique saying that he would hit him in the face and the marks would last for weeks. Rashid had no patience, he was neglectful, even Monique wasn't allowed to show any love to their children in his presence. They had Gamil and his younger sister Nadia. Rashid had the mentality that you shouldn't spoil children, which also included consoling children when they were upset. If Monique did so, she would get hurt. So we're not looking at a happy childhood here by any means. But when Gamil was five years old, Monique makes the decision to leave. The legal separation was finalised in 1971 and the divorce in 1976. For a while after the separation, Gamil and Nadia would have to see their dad on weekly supervised visits, but these soon ceased when he stopped turning up. And then they would never have to see their father again. For the sake of full transparency, I do want to say that my understanding of Mark Lepin's childhood for this video has been pieced together from a number of different sources across the internet, including his Wikipedia page. Now I usually steer clear of Wikipedia completely, but I had little choice for this video. I did intend to buy a book written by Monique Lepin, his mother, called the Aftermath, the mother of Mark Lepin tells the story of her life before and after the Montreal Massacre, to use as my main source for this video, but there was only one you used copy on Amazon that cost £80 and I don't have that kind of money for a book but the Wikipedia page cites this book as pretty much their only source into Mark's childhood so I'm using it for this portion of the video but it is Wikipedia and I'm aware that it's not always completely accurate. But that's just for his childhood, all of the information about the actual day in question comes from the coroner's investigation report into the incident so we can be sure that that is as correct as it can be, just full clarity there. Their father didn't make child support payments after he left, so now single mother Monique had to return to her job as a nurse to make ends meet, taking courses to further her career. During this time, the children would live with other family members, seeing their mother on the weekends only. Gamil was a withdrawn child, shy and quiet, but overall he was okay. It was actually Nadia who was the more challenging child, it seems. Monique was concerned by her and her children's difficulties expressing their need to love and be loved, and so she enrolled the entire family in therapy. But like I said, Gamil was just a little bit withdrawn, a little bit quiet. It was actually Nadia who the therapist said needed further attention here. When they're aged 12 and 9, they return to live with Monique, who is now the Director of Nursing at Montreal Hospital. 
I'm sure it was difficult for her, juggling motherhood with the need to provide for and love both of her children. They moved to the suburbs, a decent house, and Monique has a pretty decent income by this point. Their life just continues on and they're pretty comfortable. At age 14, Gamil legally changes his name to Mark Lapin, using his mother's maiden name and getting rid of his foreign first name that often made him the target of taunting from other children at school. He didn't really have any good close personal friendships or relationships. He had a couple of people he considered friends, but no super close relationships. And he just got more withdrawn over the years. He didn't even get on with his own sister, who would make fun of him often for his chronic acne. Perhaps this was just regular sibling teasing, but Mark took it personally, already hyper aware of all his differences. Monique sensed that Mark was missing a strong male role model in his life, so she organises for him to have a big brother. Big Brother Big Sister is a non-profit organisation which provides one-to-one -one mentoring programmes where a youth and an adult mentor meet regularly to provide the child with an adult they can turn to hopefully, helping them stay out of trouble. However, it wasn't long until Mark's big brother was actually arrested on suspicion of molesting young boys, which is not ideal. But Mark and the big brother denied that any molestation had occurred, but it is a bit questionable. Mark would never speak straight about what happened with his big brother, although the two did have a very close relationship and they got on very well. Mark really liked him. In September 1981, 17-year-old Mark attempts to join the Canadian Armed Forces as a cadet officer, but he was rejected due to being too antisocial. At least this is what Mark would later say in his suicide letter. The military's official statement was that he simply was considered to be unsuitable for the job. A year later, the entire family moved to Saint Laurent in Quebec and Mark enrolls in a two-year pre-university course in pure sciences at the CEGEP, which is a public French language community college. He also got a part-time custodial job at the local hospital where Monique was the director of nursing. Mark completes a year at college before quitting the science programme and finding his way to the field of electronic technology through a three-year technical programme. Computers. He loved computers. And he does really well in this class, his teachers describing him as hardworking and well-performing, but quiet. Despite the fact he's doing well in class, he eventually just stops turning up and never earns his diploma. It was later noted that he never showed any kinds of behavioural issues at school. However, he is eventually fired from his job at the hospital because he did display behavioural issues there. He had an inability to take instruction, general rudeness, bad work ethic and complete hyperactivity. He was known to have a problem with authority. Eventually, he moves out of his mother's house into an apartment of his own. In 1986, he's around 22 years old, he applies to study engineering at École Polytechnique de Montréal, and they tell him that he had to complete two compulsory courses before they could accept him. It was essentially a rejection with an if. If he completed these courses, he would have a chance for getting accepted next time. So he goes back to the CEGEP and takes three courses in an effort to earn his full diploma. And he does very well in all of them and gets that diploma. Instead of trying again at Ecole Polytechnique though, in February 1988 he begins a course in computer programming. Like I said, computers were Mark's biggest love, his biggest interest. In 1989, he then takes another course, a night course in solution chemistry, which was one of the compulsory courses that Ecole Polytechnique requested of him. But when he applies again in 1989, he's rejected again. It's at this point he then abandons his computer programming course entirely, although he was performing incredibly well in it. And who does he blame for his rejection from Ecole Polytechnique this time? women. He spoke openly about his hatred of feminists, his hatred of career women, and particularly his hatred of women in traditionally male occupations. He was applying for engineering courses, which is considered to be a traditionally male career, and when he was rejected, he assumes it's because a woman took his place. He believed that women should remain at home and care for their families, something which I'm sure he felt strongly about because his mother was rarely around when he was a child. She was out bettering her career, she was doing it for the sake of her family of course, to provide them with the best life possible. She was just doing what she thought was best for her family in the long run. But maybe this planted a seed in Mark. And it probably didn't help that Mark was a bit useless when it came to his love life. Girls generally weren't interested in him and he was very uncomfortable around them. 
But whilst he was uncomfortable around women, he always felt this need to boss them around, show off his knowledge and to boast of his superiority. He made it very clear that he thought he was better than any female that he came into contact with. He would always have to be the one in the right. One female lab partner of his reported how he would call her Fraulein. This lab partner actually apparently did take an interest in Mark. She thought that he was very good looking and they would hang out often in early 1989, despite her describing him as a fascist. Eventually, he just became completely uncommunicative and withdrawn and she gave up trying to get to know him. So it's not like he was bitter because he had nobody showing him any attention. He did have people showing him attention. He just wasn't really interested. Over time, his thoughts and feelings on this subject, on feminism, got more and more intense and Mark starts to let the world know his views, as if he just can't keep his thoughts inside any longer. He goes mad one day when he turns up to class with a newspaper clipping about a policewoman, writing about how women should not be allowed on the police force. He would regularly lecture people about women in male occupations, like literally anyone who would listen, down to the employees at his local grocery store. He actually meets with a university admissions officer at one point and makes the complaint that women are taking over the job market from men, that it's not fair that he's been rejected from the university when a girl has probably taken his place. So it seems like Mark knew months before the massacre happened what his next step was going to have to be. In August, September 1989, he picks up an application for a firearms acquisition certificate, getting his permit through in mid-October. In November, he goes to Checkmate Sports, a shop he spent quite a lot of time browsing in, and purchased a Ruger Mini-14 semi-automatic rifle. It can hold up to 50 rounds of ammunition in its magazine and used to be one of the most popular rifles in Canada, with deadly accuracy even at long distances. It was described as a hunting rifle for larger animals such as coyotes or deer. And now, Mark had his hands on one of these guns. The day after purchasing the gun, Mark was seen wandering around at Cole Polytechnique, particularly the engineering school, even though he wasn't a student. He was seen again multiple times throughout the beginning of December. Four days before the shooting, he turns up at his mum's house with a birthday present for her, something which she said she did find strange at the time because her birthday wasn't for a number of weeks, but Mark insisted that she took it then. Monique said, although she thought it was a bit strange, she never dreamed of what the real reason behind it was. Mark knew he was gonna die. For the same reason, he also didn't pay his rent in December. He went into the month knowing exactly what was going to happen. He'd been planning it for months. On December 6th, 1989, Mark Lepin walks into the Ikol Polytechnique. He's seen sitting on a bench in the entrance to the office of the registrar between 4 and 4.40 p.m. People noted him sitting there as he was sitting in such a way that actually impeded access to the office. Many people also noted that he kept rummaging in a green plastic bag that was sat beside him, but nobody saw what was inside it. During this time, he spoke to no one and no student spoke to him. Only an employee working in the office asked whether she could help him. He didn't answer her and just got up and left. He heads to the second floor just after 5pm and enters the classroom where mechanical engineering students were holding a presentation. He orders the male and female students to line up on opposite sides of the room, but they don't immediately comply, thinking it's some kind of prank. They soon get the picture though once Mark fires the gun he was holding into the ceiling twice. After the two groups had formed either side of the classroom, Mark tells the men to leave, and of course the class was mostly made up of male students. The men, not really knowing what was going on at this point, were rushed out of the classroom. And no one knew what Mark's real motive was here. The men were still thinking it was just some kind of end of semester prank, that he was just firing blanks. It was the last day of term and pranks usually happened on the last day of term. Outside the classroom, everything was normal. People were just a bit confused. Then the gunshot started. 23-year-old Natalie Provost was one of the young women in the classroom, one of the few who survived. She has said that Mark told them they were all there because they were feminists, but Natalie speaks up, saying something along the lines of, we are not feminists, I have never fought against men. But then he opens fire, starting left to right, just shooting across the line. Natalie herself is shot with bullets in the forehead, both legs and foot, but she survives the ordeal. She was one of the lucky ones, but says that whilst her physical wounds healed, the wounds of seeing her classmates die in front of her will never heal. He shot about 30 rounds at the woman, who either died instantly or played dead until he left the room. 
six died in that classroom. As people figured out what was going on outside, chaos ensued. People ran and hid, people screamed. Mark passed down the corridor, just shooting into random rooms, attempting to gain access to a locked classroom by shooting the door three times. But he runs out of bullets and has to stop to reload. He heads towards the foyer, down the escalator and into the cafeteria on the first floor, where about a hundred people were sat. He aims and fires at a female student near the wall by the kitchen and she dies instantly. He reaches an unlocked storage area and looks inside, shooting and killing two students who are hiding in there. He then heads to the third floor, at this point it's around 5.25pm. He enters a classroom and tells the three students in there giving a presentation to get out. He fires at one of the students, the female on the platform, injuring her, and then fires again at students sitting in the front row. Two female students who tried to get out of the front door of the classroom were shot and would later die. He continues shooting as people try to escape and then approaches the platform where the injured woman was calling for help. He stabs her three times with a hunting knife he had on him. Once he was done, he sat down, removed his coat and fired the last bullet of the magazine into his own head. A later autopsy found he had no alcohol or drugs in his system. The police were alerted of course, but they wouldn't arrive until it was ultimately too late. The first call was received at 5.12pm, saying there was a shooting on the second floor and the individual responsible had told the boys to leave but had kept the girls. More calls were received over the coming minutes. There were some issues transferring the calls though, so there was a slight delay in getting a police response. But by 5.17pm, both medical and police vehicles were on their way to the scene. Upon arrival, it was requested that another ambulance got sent because it seems like there were several people injured. But even at that point, only one more ambulance was requested. Nobody had a clue how serious the situation really was. It was unprecedented. Things like this just didn't happen in Canada. At 5.27pm, the first injured victims who had left the building of their own accord are taken to hospital via ambulance. It's not entirely clear here, but it does seem that no one entered the building for the first 20 minutes after the emergency services arrived. They first had to secure off all the exits. By the time emergency response personnel entered the building, the pin was already dead. The entire thing inside went on for barely 20 minutes. In that time, 14 women were killed and another 14 were injured, including four men. The victims included 12 engineering students, one nursing student and one clerk in the financial department. Almost all of them were young, under the age of 25. When Le Pin was found, he had a three-page handwritten letter in the inside pocket of his jacket, all written by himself and dated December 6th, 1989. I'm not going to read the whole thing out, it seems unnecessary and it kind of feels like I'd be doing him a favour by sharing his disgusting ramblings with the world. If you want to find it online, it's pretty easy to. A brief synopsis of the letter is that he was not committing suicide for economic reasons, but for political reasons, because he had decided to send the feminists who have always ruined his life to their maker. He alludes that he'd been having these thoughts for seven years. He says that he wanted to enter the forces when he was younger because it would have allowed him to get into the arsenal and to do this earlier, but he was refused from the forces and therefore he's had to wait until now to do it. He says he's never bothered with his studies because he always knew that this was going to be his fate. He says the feminists have always enraged him. He writes, they want to keep the advantages of women, e.g. cheaper insurance, extended maternity leave preceded by preventive leave, while seizing for themselves those of men. He also goes on to rant about the Olympic Games, saying that if they remove the men-woman distinction, then there would be women only in the more graceful events, and he's mad that feminists aren't fighting to remove that barrier in the Olympic Games. Nothing he writes really makes that much sense, but it clearly made sense to him. He signs off his name, but following the letter, there was a list of 19 names with a note at the bottom that says, nearly died today. The lack of time, because I started too late, has allowed these radical feminists to survive. He lists 19 Quebec women who he wishes to kill because he considered them to be feminists. They were mostly women who were powerful or high up in their chosen careers, including union leaders, journalists, and politicians. It seems they only survived because Mark Le Pin didn't have access to them. He also wrote a letter addressed to a friend in which he promised answers at the end of clues in his apartment, but nothing was found but our video games. Here I'm going to list for you the 14 victims of the Ecole Polytechnique massacre. 23 year old Annie Saint Arnaud was at the time of her death trying to figure out what she wanted to do with her life. 
Did she want to take a job at an aluminium smelter? Or did she want to join her brother in Africa and become a missionary? She wanted to make the world a better place and was attending her final ever class before graduation when she died. She wrote poetry and was crafty and had a passion for the environment. 23 year old Helen Colgan was also nearing the end of her degree and had already been offered three jobs. She was trying to decide which one she wanted to take and where she wanted her life to take her. She was the kind of person who was always busy, always juggling things, but was really excited for a trip to Cancun with her friends over the new year, which her dad said she really deserved. And the trip included her best friend, Natalie Cretel, who also died. 23 year old Natalie loved science and had a passion for learning. She loved being at university and was just three months away from graduating. The idea that she was killed purely because she was sat in a university room went against everything that Natalie loved and believed in. 22 year old Barbara Daniel had goals to become an engineer. She was described by her professor as a marvellous girl, very nice, very smart. And she worked as a teaching assistant for her father who was a mechanical engineering professor himself. Anne-Marie Edward was 21. Her greatest passion in life was skiing and she was part of the school ski team, but she loved all extreme sports, happy to take on any challenge that she could. She was studying chemical engineering. Genevieve Bergeron was just 21 years old and was a second year civil engineering student at the university on a scholarship. She was also a talented musician. She loved the clarinet and she loved singing. She was trying to decide between a career in engineering or music. 29 year old Maud Haviernik was an older student, having already achieved a degree in environmental design and worked as an interior designer. She decided to go back to school and fulfill her dreams of becoming an engineer. She was the kind of person who was described as a go-getter. If she had a goal, she would reach it. 31 year old Barbara Kluznik Widierich was in her first year at nursing school when she was killed in the cafeteria where she was eating dinner with her husband. She was born in Poland and eventually ended up marrying her high school sweetheart. She was a jack of all trades, incredibly smart. She spoke five languages and loved to read. The couple had had to flee Poland for Germany after the country was put under martial law, but they managed to get an aunt in Quebec to sponsor them because Canada seemed safe. They'd been in Quebec for about two and a half years when Barbara died. Anne-Marie LeMay was 22 years old and wanted to help people. She'd always wanted to go into healthcare but decided to go into mechanical engineering after a friend lost the use of his legs and Anne-Marie realised how important mechanical devices are to help those with disabilities. Marie Slanganier was 25, the youngest of 14 children. She was a budget clerk for the school's finance department and she was newly married to the love of her life who she'd met at the university. They'd been married for just three months and her husband believes that Maurice may have been pregnant when she died. 23 year old Maurice Leclerc was in her fourth year of engineering and she's been described as a bit of a rebel. She lived life on her own terms and didn't care what other people thought of her. Her father was lieutenant with the Montreal police and was the one to find her body. Sonia Pelletier was 28 years old and just days away from graduating with straight A's. She was the kind of person who won every competition, secured every scholarship and she was always top of the class. She was very bright, she brought so much pride to her family and she loved rock music and cooking. 21 year old Michelle Richard was called Mimi by her friends. She had a magnetic energy, people were always drawn to her and she had plans to get engaged to her boyfriend who told reporters that she was a gentle girl, happy, brilliant, beautiful. She lived every moment intensely and she abhorred violence. And finally, 21 year old Annie Tocotte. She was attending a Cole Polytechnique after she won a woman in science bursary. She was interested in metallurgical engineering and was way ahead of her time. She intended to find ways to protect the environment. Annie loved children and they loved her and she spent her summers teaching swimming lessons for free for any children staying in her family's motel. Each of the victims was a woman who just wanted an education or had a passion for engineering or a passion for whatever engineering could bring them. Lepin targeted Polytechnique specifically because the women there were pursuing careers in engineering, a discipline he believed should be reserved for men. They were targeted for having passion, for having knowledge, for wanting to better themselves or better the world. These women weren't taking up space in a men's world, they were creating more space for anyone who wanted to pursue their dreams. And they died for it. Natalie Provost, one of the survivors, said at the time that she was not a feminist. She said she equated feminism with her mother's era, the struggle for the right to vote, for abortion. 
But today, she's a senior manager for the Quebec government and she fully identifies as a feminist, as every woman and man should. Feminism, by definition, is the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of the equality of the sexes. Equality being the key word there. Feminism isn't fighting for women to have better rights than men, just the same rights. Feminists do not believe that women are better than men, nor that they deserve special privileges. Feminism does not equal misandry, which is defined as the dislike of, contempt for, or ingrained prejudice against men, which is the opposite equivalent to misogyny. Feminism is simply the idea that all humans, male and female and non-binary individuals, should have equal political, economic and social rights. And no matter how you want to argue it, females are not equal to men to say society. Is it better than it was 100 or even 50 years ago? Without a doubt. Are there areas in society in which men need to be risen up to the same level of women? Absolutely. And feminism is about working towards those goals also. It's not a dirty word, it's about making things an even playing field. And if you live comfortably in a western country thinking that you don't know what these feminists are on about, women have it fine, just look further afield. Look at countries which don't have the same equality laws as the western world. Look at teenage girls suffering FGM in 30 plus countries because it's still legal there. Or the 18 countries where husbands can legally prevent their wives from working. The fact that female representation in national parliaments is just 23.7% according to the United Nations. 35% of women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner violence, yet 49 countries have no laws whatsoever to protect against such violence. According to a global study on homicide, of all women globally who were victims of homicide in 2012, half of these were killed by intimate partners or family members. That is what feminism is about. And it is also about all the other things you read about, about stopping catcalling on the streets. No, it's not a compliment. Or getting rid of the glass ceiling, or giving women bodily autonomy. I struggle to understand why anybody would refuse to consider themselves a feminist. Surely equal rights, which is what feminism is, equal rights, can only be a good thing. And before anybody in the comments feels the need to call me a bloody lefty or a liberal or an SJW, I am all of those things and I'm proud of it. It's not an insult to point out that I support social equality. It's really not. It's actually kind of a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. I'm going to share with you here an excerpt from the coroner's investigation report into this tragedy that looks into the motive, the mental state behind Mark Lepin or anyone who commits similar crimes to him. The coroner writes, in the case of individuals who use the multiple homicide slash suicide strategy, we find extreme narcissistic vulnerability manifested in the level of expectations and demands placed on themselves through fantasies of success and powerfulness or through a desire and need for recognition by others, through an extreme sensitivity to rejection and failure, through intolerance to depressing emotions experienced such only badly or to a slight extent. We also frequently find retreat into a violent and sometimes grandiose imaginary life as an attempt to compensate for a fundamental feeling of powerlessness and incompetence. In the psychiatrist's opinion, this description of the aggressive and grandiose imaginary life is applicable to Mark Lepin. This was written soon after the massacre, signed off on May 10th, 1991. Mark Lepin didn't have access to the internet as we know it today, but imagine if he did. Nowadays, people can go to their dark corners on the internet and share their thoughts and feelings about feminism, about anything, spreading that infectious hatred. Mark Lepin decided to do this of his own accord, it seems, but I can't help but feel that if something like this happened today, and it very well might do, then the person would only feel more empowered by the internet, by the ability to find someone with similar thoughts and feelings to yourself at just the click of a button, someone to justify those thoughts. If you're brave enough, just search for any video on YouTube to do with Lepin or the massacre. Scroll down to the bottom of the comments and you will find mail after mail justifying Lepin's actions, saying that of course he did this, he was forced into this by his mother, forced into it because women wouldn't show him attention. He had no choice because according to them, society is man-hating. And I found these comments were just a cursory search on YouTube. It was very easy. These are comments that people are just brazenly leaving on the internet on YouTube today. Imagine what they're saying in the darker corners. Something like this will happen again because these people feel empowered by their hatred. Even certain world leaders nowadays, no names mentioned, are on a public platform demeaning women, talking down on them, sexualizing them, 
all whilst in this position of power. That doesn't send a good message to people like Mark Lepin who are already manifesting these dangerous thoughts. And feminism is still largely misrepresented in the media. Feminists are made to look unstable, unreasonable, just wanting to take rights away from men. And that sends the wrong message. The media largely reinforces these beliefs that the people have. The aftermath of the massacre was hard on Canada. It is to this day the deadliest mass shooting in Canadian history. To this day, the 6th of December is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, established by the Parliament of Canada in 1991. There can never really be a positive to come out of an event like this. It was a tragedy that was felt across Canada, but it eventually led to people looking at how society treats women. Every year on the 6th of December, Canada uses the day to reflect, to ensure that people are aware of what occurred. But this hasn't always been the case. The immediate media narrative around the shooting was that this wasn't a reflection of Mark Lepin's view on feminism, despite the very obviously worded letter that he left at the scene. This was because, apparently, he had mental health problems. We are now in 2020, and whenever there's an act of terrorism committed by a white person, this hasn't changed. It's always just a mentally ill loner. All accountability was taken away by the media. Mark didn't know what he was doing, he was mentally ill. Whilst Mark himself said in his suicide letter this was a political act, by definition it was an act of terrorism against feminists, against women, and he literally wrote the words in the letter, even if the mad killer epithet will be attributed to me by the media, I consider myself a rational erudite. He correctly anticipated that the media would perceive him as mad and his him himself saying that he is quite sane, he knows what he's doing, he's made the decision to do it. Maybe he did have some kind of personality disorder, he definitely had signs of narcissism and grandiose, but he was still aware of what he was doing, he still had full mental capacity. People, the media just had to find excuses for him. I would argue it wasn't actually a problem with feminists that Mark had, it was with women as a whole. Even when Natalie told him that she didn't consider herself a feminist, she still got shot. Perhaps he didn't see the distinction, perhaps he was just angry at all women, he was using feminism as a cover to justify his acts. He was angry that they were going to be engineers whilst he'd been rejected. Whilst the women didn't see this as a politically motivated act, it was just a job they wanted, Mark saw this as a feminist act when purposely taking jobs away from men. These women left those safe spaces assigned to them, the home, caregiving and mothering, and entered a space that Mark Lepin saw as meant for men. And for that, they gave their lives. To Mark Lepin, feminist was a dirty word, a word that justified the murder of 14 women. And so many still see feminist as a dirty word today. It isn't. Feminism means equality. Feminism serves males just as much as it serves females. If it doesn't, it's not feminism. I'm really nervous to post this video because I know people on the internet are very vocal about the hatred of feminists and feminism, but I think it's important that we talk about things like this. Um, I don't really know how to end this video, I suppose. I just think it's important that things like this are spoken about. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.